We're going to undertake a, uh, a little different kind of series tonight. And um, it's interesting that the Bible includes two major, major themes, the two biggest themes throughout these 66 books that we call the Bible, that obviously are, although penned by 40 different guys over thousands of years, are an integrated message. And in that message, we find two major themes. One of those themes we talk a great deal about, and that's the theme of the Messiah from Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, the first promise, explicit promise of that, all the way through, of course, the primary theme of the Scriptures, the presentation of the Messiah, Jesus Christ, and his role, his mission, his destiny, and that which he's done for us. But there's another major theme also that over five-sixths of the Bible focuses on, that, of course, is Israel. And I think most of us, if we're Christians, are brought up from a background that tends to be more intensively New Testament than Old Testament. We've been, unfortunately, uh, victims of the myth that somehow the New Testament displaces the Old or replaces it, which is a tragic misconception. It's tragic for both the Christians and the Jews. It's tragic for the Christians because we have failed to perceive the whole counsel of God. We fail to really understand what God is doing, and we fail to really understand the treasures that he's provided for us. It's, of course, tragic for the Jews also because this has been one of the roots of anti-Semitism. But I think most of us in this group are sophisticated enough to recognize the value of really understanding the whole counsel of God, the whole Bible. And one of the places that we work hard at is trying to focus a bit on the Old Testament because it's so tragically neglected in most of our Christian backgrounds. So one of the things that um, we are doing in general in our ministry is trying to highlight Israel. I love the way Arnold Ruckenbaum points it out, the title of his PhD thesis, which is now a hardback book. Uh, Israelology is the missing link of systematic theology. It's fascinating. You can go to most theological libraries or sets of systematic theology and, and you'll discover the table of contents of most. These are almost identical. The major divisions of theology are very predictable in terms of Christology and pneumatology and all these various labels they give, the major segments of what's called systematic theology. But it's interesting, one of the areas of theology that's omitted in all of these constitutes about five-sixths of the Bible, strangely enough. And that's the study of Israel as an instrument of God's plan. Not just Israel in a, in a nationalistic sense alone or any of those things, but rather in a, in a broader theological context. How God has chosen this peculiar people to accomplish some very peculiar things on his part. So uh, we focus on that a little bit. So one of the things that we also would like to do in this series of studies is uh, take the time to focus on Israel in an unusual way. I thought what we'd do is we'll spend a few evenings exploring the twelve tribes... We use that term so glibly, only to discover they're not 12, they're 13 in the first place. It's a baker's dozen, if you will. But also, you'll disco- we'll discover as we go many things that will be perhaps a rather startling surprise that God has hidden away in these things. It's, it's amazing to me how you can almost take any subject in the Bible, and as you start to study it diligently and with some intensity... It always yields surprises, and those surprises almost invariably point to, guess who? Jesus Christ. And so I thought what we would do is take the opportunity. Most of you that come to these studies have, by just your being here, uh, evidenced your interest in taking the Bible seriously. I thought we'd explore this in a little more depth than we usually have time for by actually just focusing on the passages that deal with the twelve tribes. And uh, all this probably, in a sense, in a 12-tribe sense anyway, if you look for a place to begin, I thought we'd begin with Genesis chapter 12. We'll discover as we explore Israel in any context that it involves a number of covenants. And one of the things that we should do on some occasion, we won't do it in that depth this time, but I encourage you on your own, it's very easy to do, is to make an intensive study of the covenants in the Scripture. The covenant with Noah is a good place to begin. There's a number of covenants, and you can go through and organize your biblical notes in terms of studying the various covenants. But the ones we're going to talk about a little bit here are the four covenants that are unconditional. Usually a covenant is a two-way deal. You do this and I'll do this kind of thing. But there are four of them that God made that are unconditional, that are unilateral, that are strictly on his part. And the first one, of course, was made with Abraham and his descendants. And it was then confirmed to his descendants through Isaac and Jacob. And the destiny 
of the entire world hangs on God's faithfulness to those covenants. The only conditional covenant we, we won't touch much on in this particular study is the Mosaic Covenant. We'll move on to, we get a lot of uh, visibility of that in our typical studies. But one of the, one of the things that I, I have to mention in passing here is for us not to be guilty of buying into this lie, this myth, this blasphemy that God has abandoned Israel, that it has somehow been replaced by the church. That's widely taught. That's been the doctrine of the Catholic Church. It's also carried over into most of the mainline Protestant denominations. It also makes up a great deal of publication even today. It's amazing how many people still hold those views despite the non-biblical basis of them. The church and Israel are distinct. We have uh, uh, published a number of materials, not the least of which is a briefing package called The Prodigal Heirs, dealing with both the, the origin, mission, and destiny, and failures of both Israel and the church. They're quite distinct, quite different, worth your attention. And it's interesting that this misconception that God has somehow set Israel aside permanently is the misconception that lies under the tragic, misguided policies that are presently being pursued in the Middle East. And uh, it's leading the whole world, as we speak, towards conflict, which, which will eventually climax in Armageddon. In fact, we're just releasing a, a briefing package called The Next Holocaust, which gets at, at this in focus. But let's start with Genesis chapter 12, where God calls Abram in the first place. Chapter 12, Now the Lord said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country. By the way, the Lord had said. Abram didn't do it at first. You miss this if you study it casually. You have to, when you get to Acts chapter 7, you encounter one of the more uh, fascinating commentaries on the Old Testament. Stephen's presentation before the Sanhedrin is an example of Jewish chutzpah. Here's a young guy on trial for his life before the most august body in Israel, and he chooses to give them a history lesson on the Old Testament. That takes chutzpah. But as you go through Acts 7 where he details that, there's a number of discoveries if you study Acts 7 carefully. Uh, And that's a whole study that I'm going to try hard not to derail ourselves getting into tonight. But the point is, he makes the point that Israel, that uh, in effect, that Abram didn't initially obey God. He just moved up river a bit until his father died. But in any case, the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, from thy kindred and from thy father's house, unto a land I will show thee. And indeed, when his father Terah dies, he does perform this. And it's interesting how God is so graceful that his sins are blotted out. You really have to do some digging to discover Abraham's incomplete uh, faith in those early days. But in any case, uh, God says here, uh, uh, to reminds him of what he'd said, that get thee out of thy country, from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation. And I will bless thee and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. An incredible commitment by God to Abram and his descendants, and that has never been repealed. It's operative today. I have obtained a few little scraps of a scud missile, and I haven't had the time to get it organized. I want to put it on a small walnut plaque for my office, and under it I'm going to put Genesis 12, 3. Because that, uh, that is a major warning to all anti-Semites. It's a scary thing when you think about it. But anyway, this uh, a passage here, I will make thee a great nation and so forth, is a famous blessing that God has pronounced. It includes seven I wills. I will make of thee a great nation. I will bless thee. Personally, that is. I will make thy name great. I will, and, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee. And will curse him that curseth thee. And in these shall, will all the nations, all the families of the earth be blessed. It's interesting that this curse announced here will still be valid at the second coming of Jesus Christ. Because in Matthew 25, you may recall, we have this sheep and goat judgment. It's actually a three-party issue. There's the sheep, the goats, and his brethren. And the sheep and the goats are judged by how they treated his brethren. A, a widely misunderstood uh, Uh, third-party measure, if you will, by Jesus at his second coming. So that's the Abrahamic covenant. Skip down to verse 7. The Lord appeared unto Abram and said, Unto thy seed will I give this land, and there builded he an altar unto the Lord uh, who appeared to him. It's funny. When you watch Abram, you always see him build altars. Every place he goes, he builds altars. 
he said to have an altered life, if you will. Okay. Already here, in, right before chapter 12 finishes, God ties up his relationship with Abram, with the land. We find that all through the scripture. And it says, the Lord says, unto thy seed will I give this land. It's an interesting study. The word give appears over 1,000 times in the Bible. The greatest frequency of that book has to do with God giving the land of Israel to Abram's descendants. And that was confirmed to Isaac and to Jacob. So we're talking Jewish here, not Ishmael. It's interesting that the truth that's announced here in, in, in verse 7 of chapter 12 is reconfirmed 150 times in the Old Testament. So this issue of Israel and the land is not incidental, it is not peripheral theology, it's central to God's purposes. And one reason we are undertaking this study is the recognition that this is a central issue before the world today. As our politicians meddle in the Middle East, they're poking their finger into the eye of God. Because ultimately, in the, in the bottom line, God's faithfulness, God's righteousness is at issue. The whole premise of the meddling going on there is that God is not a player. And that's a gigantic mistake. A gigantic mistake. Now, this uh, same theme picks up even in chapter 13, verse 14. The Lord said unto Abram, Lot was separated from him, Lift up now thine eyes and look from the place where thou art, northward, southward, eastward, and westward. For all the land which thou seest, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed for several years. Right? No, that's not what it says. Forever. I will give to thy seed forever. I won't take the time to go into Genesis 15. We've talked a lot about that. In Genesis 15, we have this ceremonial sealing of the title deed of the land. Where uh, Abram's put in a deep sleep in, in Genesis 15. And God sets up the traditional way of confirming a covenant by taking an offering, splitting it in two. And the participants pass through between these elements. And Abram is in a deep sleep. He can't pass through. The Lord passes through on his own. It's a unilateral covenant, one-way deal. And it's interesting when you read this in verse 18 of chapter 15. In the same day that the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, Unto thy seed have I given this land from the river Egypt to the great river Euphrates. I love that phrase. Because the land grant to Israel goes to the river Euphrates. If you want to talk about the West Bank, ask them which river you have in mind. Of course, they obviously mean the Jordan, but the scripture actually ultimately, and I believe this, is, this will be fulfilled only in the kingdom age, uh, will go to the river Euphrates. One incidental part for you for prophecy buffs, you'll notice the next three verses lists ten nations that are against this or involved by this. Ten nations are listed there. When Joshua goes into the land, the conquest of Canaan, he faces seven nations. Three were put down before they went west of the Jordan. How interesting it is, there were originally ten, but there's seven that the conflict is with. How interesting it is in the final analysis from Daniel and Revelation that the Antichrist, there's originally ten, but three are put down, so there's seven we have uh, seven heads and ten horns and so forth in the scripture. And how interesting that's modeled in advance in the Old Testament. So I'll leave you mystics to chase that one down. But we'll move on. And of course Moses and Ezekiel both confirm all what I've just said in Deuteronomy 30 and Ezekiel 16 and Ezekiel 36 and other passages. Another covenant that will probably become significant as we get into our study of the twelve tribes is the Davidic covenant. The Davidic covenant. And that's commonly alluded to as being nailed down in 2 Samuel chapter 7. And that's the place where Nathan announces to David that God is going to make of him a dynasty. And um, in uh, 2 Samuel chapter 7, starting about verse 11, as at that time I commanded judges to be over my people Israel. And have caused thee to rest from all thine enemies. Also the Lord telleth thee that he will build thee a house. David wanted to build the Lord a house. And the Lord says, no, your son Solomon is going to do that. But the Lord's going to build David a house. He says, verse 12. When thy days are be fulfilled and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thine own body. And I will establish his kingdom, and he shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. And I will be his father, and he shall be my son, and so forth. 
the beginning of the Davidic covenant. That's a little misleading in my judgment. It may come as a shock to you to discover that the kingship of David was prophesied at the time of the judges. And we discover this if we're diligent in our study of the book of Ruth. Because at the close of the book of Ruth, there's a cryptic promise which, when unraveled, yields the insight that the tenth generation from Perez would be David. And it's appended to the book of Ruth. It comes from a prophecy that was given at the wedding of Boaz and Ruth. They say, may your house be like Perez. And you, you know, if you read that superficially, say, gee, it sounds like a wonderful toast. If you understand that Perez was the illegitimate son of this horrible event that occurred between Judah and his daughter-in-law, then you wonder, you know, if somebody said that to you in your wedding, you'd say, same to you, fella. I mean, what's going on? And you have to understand the rabbinical principle that's in, from the Torah in which the illegitimate son can't inherit till the 10th generation. The 10th generation from Perez was David. In effect, it is a hidden prophecy that David was destined to be king. One reason Samuel could anoint Saul from the tribe of Benjamin is he must have understood that the tribe of Judah, the, the royal line, was not ready yet. It was still suffering from the illegitimacy of Perez. And that God had a plan for them to have a king. Their impatience... For a king is what led Saul to be anointed. But uh, God had all along, back in the time of Judges, revealed that he had his eye on David. So kind of interesting background. But uh, anyway, you and I will move on. Many people try to put themselves under the law. You should understand that the curses are just as binding as the blessings. And so if you're going to get under Deuteronomy 30 and Ezekiel 16, you want to read it very carefully. There's another covenant that will come up as we unfold our story, and that's a strange covenant. And that's what uh, Isaiah calls the covenant with Sheol, the covenant with death. Uh, Isaiah makes that remark in Isaiah 28. Uh, but uh, that, of course, is the covenant with the Antichrist that uh, is de- defines the seven-year period called the 70th week of Daniel. That's in Daniel 9.27. We'll touch upon that as we go. And, of course, the upbeat part of these covenants, of course, is the new covenant in Jeremiah 31. Most of us have been exposed to that. In Jeremiah 31, verses 31 to 34, there's again the unilateral I wills by God, an unconditional covenant that predicts the um, regeneration of the nation Israel. And uh, it's partially enforced according to Hebrews 10, verses 14 through 18. And it's available to us only in our union with Christ, as Christ indeed was a son of Abraham and David, and so forth. So we could spend a lot of time on the new covenant, but let us keep moving on to our primary goal here, which is to try to understand Israel and to try to particularly focus on the role of the 12 tribes, because they come up all through the scripture, and in fact, in some surprising places. What is the destiny of the disciples, the 12 apostles? That be, the disciples, while he's alive, they become the ascent ones, the apostles. What is their destiny? Turn to Matthew 19. And they have an express destiny that catches some people by surprise. In Matthew chapter 19, verse 28, Jesus said unto them, his apostles, Verily I say unto you, that ye who have followed me in the regeneration, when the Son of Man shall sit on the throne of his glory, ye also shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging whom? The twelve tribes of Israel. That's pretty interesting. You find that same confirmation in Luke chapter 22, verse 30, a parallel reference to the same thing. So we're going to try to focus our attention uh, tonight and for a couple of these studies here on the 12 tribes. And I guess the best place to start is where they start. Obviously, Abraham has a son by the name of Isaac. Isaac has a son by the name of Jacob. And Jacob is the patriarch of of 12 sons that become the 12 tribes. Jacob is an interesting study in his own right. I encourage you to really understand Jacob. He was a conniving schemer. Paul in Romans 8 builds a model for whom he uh, foreknew those he predestinated, whom he predestinated, them he also called, whom he called, them he also justified, whom he justified, them he also glorified. Those four levels are the four patriarchs. Abraham was the elect. Isaac was called. Jacob was justified. Joseph was glorified. And it's reasonable to assume that Paul in his mind may have had that structure in his mind as he penned that summary statement in Romans chapter 8. In any case, if God can justify Jacob, he can, there's hope for all of us. <laughs> and uh, I take great hope in that, being a, 
accused at least by some of my detractors as a schemer and a conniver. So uh, to the extent that's true, and I guess it must be, I take great comfort in the fact that if God can justify Jacob, there's perhaps hope for me. But we'll move on. Jacob has, as you know, 12 sons. Let's just explore uh, their beginning as we start our study. As you may recall, he had his heart set on Rachel. And by the chicanery of um, Laban, there's a switch. A Jewish wedding apparently having a veil allowed that to happen. In any case, he discovers that the older sister is the one that got pawned off in the wedding ceremony. Wakes up in the morning with a real headache, I guess. But God is teaching Jacob a lesson here. He's teaching Jacob a lesson of the rights of the firstborn. Because you remember the chicanery that Jacob indulged in to Isaac over his older brother Esau. So as you read those stories, you begin to realize there's far more going on here than first catches your eye. So in effect, Jacob's getting a bitter lesson in the rights of the firstborn. But what he does, of course, he works seven years for the right to marry Rachel, but gets Leah instead. But he contracts with Laban to work another seven years for uh, the one he really wanted, which is Rachel. By the way, when he says that to Laban, you'll notice if you read the passage that he says, fulfill her week. It's a week of years. It's one of those places in the scripture where a week is not necessarily days, it's years in that case. A good support to your understanding of Daniel 9. But moving on. Anyway, so here's Jacob with two wives. Leah and Rachel. Now, in chapter 29, we'll pick up the thread here. Well, let's pick up verse 30. You need to understand this too. He went in unto Rachel, and he loved Rachel more than Leah, and served with him yet seven other years. Jacob loved Rachel. The scripture implies that he loved her more than life itself. As just a footnote in modern politics, one of the most venerated sites to a Jew in Israel is that place which is at least uh, traditionally uh, recognized as Rachel's tomb, which by current politics has been put in the West Bank. But moving on. Verse uh, 31, And when the Lord saw that Leah was hated, he opened her womb, but Rachel was barren. And Leah conceived... And bore a son. This is the firstborn son of Jacob, the firstborn son. She called his name Reuben. For she said, Surely the Lord hath looked upon my affliction. Now therefore my husband will love me. That was her logic. The word Reuben comes from roots which seem to imply, Behold a son. He is the firstborn. One of the things we'll see a great deal of emphasis throughout the scripture is the positional rights of the firstborn. Jesus is sometimes called the firstborn of creation. doesn't mean he was created. It's a positional thing that he's ahead of and so forth. So many people misunderstand that term. The word firstborn means firstborn, but also comes to mean that in a, of a superior position. We're going to discover when we get to Exodus chapter 4 verse 22 that the nation Israel is called God's firstborn son meaning that she's entitled to a double portion, and she's going to get not only a double portion of blessing, but a double portion of judgment when she's wrong. That sword cuts both ways, so to speak. Reuben is the firstborn. We're going to discover a lot about Reuben. He blows it and loses his position. But we'll move on. But anyway, Reuben is the firstborn here from chapter 29, verse 32. In the next verse, we're going to have a couple of really fast verses here. Verse 33, she conceived again and bore a son and said, Because the Lord hath heard that I was hated, he hath therefore given me this son also and called his name Simeon. And Simeon comes from a root which seems to imply heard, like heard, since the Lord had heard me. See, that was the, that's the emphasis here. Uh, therefore the Lord hath given me this son also, called his name Simeon. It's interesting how these names seem to derive from the condition or state of mind at birth, understandable, and yet these labels will tend to have echoes throughout history as we'll watch. And uh, I'll come to that in a minute. But verse 34, she conceived again and bore a son and said, now this time will my husband become attached unto me because I have borne him three sons. Therefore was his name called Levi. Levi comes from a root which implies joined to or attached to. 
And Levi is going to be one of the more important tribes that we're going to study the history of, both prophetically and what have you. Okay. And verse 35, last verse of chapter 29. She conceived again and bore a son, and she said, Now will I praise the Lord. Therefore she called his name Judah, and she ceased bearing. The word Judah means praise. That gives us the first four of the twelve tribes, born from the eldest of the wives, the first four. In many of the listings, we'll discover that the twelve tribes are listed twenty times in the scripture. Each time they're listed, they're in a different order. But in many of those lists, these four will be listed first for two different reasons. On the one hand, they're the first in the order of their birth, and the other reason is because they are from the true wives. The true sons of both Leah and Rachel are often given precedence in some of these lists as opposed to the concubines which you're about to come to. Let's go into chapter 30 as Jacob's family grows. We have four of them born so far. And of course, uh, Rachel uh, saw that Jacob bore no children. Rachel envied her sister, understandable, and said unto Jacob, Give me children or else I die. Jacob's anger was kindled against Rachel. He said, Am I God's uh, stead who hath withheld from thee the fruit of thy womb? Jacob doesn't seem to be too long on tact either, I guess. But uh, So she said, Behold my maid Bilhah. Go in unto her, and she shall bear upon my knees, that I may also have children by her. That idea is strange to our ears, but you should understand that in those days, according to the Code of Hammurabi and other uh, traditions uh, extant in Mesopotamia in the early years, that was a very common practice, that if the mistress of the house was barren, that she could provide her husband a concubine, typically her handmaid, to, in effect, be a biological substitute for her. Strikes us as strange, but you need to understand that was the cultural practice of that day. And so while it it seems very bizarre to us, that is a a practice that was common. And so verse 4, she uh, gave Bilhah her handmaid as his wife, and Jacob went in unto her. And Bilhah conceived and bore Jacob a son. And Rachel said, God hath judged me, and hath also heard my voice, and hath given me a son. Therefore call his name Dan, which means judge. Daniel, God is my judge, El being the name of God. Dan is, comes from a root, which means judge, or judging, or whatever. Bilhah, Rachel's maid, conceived again, and bore Jacob a second son. And Rachel said, With great wrestlings have I wrestled with my sister, and I have prevailed. I'm a little confused by that. I think it was Bilhah that had the labor pains, but I guess that's not what she's talking about. She said, I have prevailed, and she called his name Naphtali, which means wrestling. And obviously what she's referring to is the strivings and things that have gone on between her and her rival wife, Leah. And uh, so now you see uh, Bilhah has provided two other offspring, so now the total is six. Four with Leah, then two with the concubine uh, provided by Rachel. So Leah sees a good thing working. She's not to be undone, outdone. So verse 9, when Leah saw that she had ceased bearing, she took Zilpah, her maid, and gave her Jacob as his wife. And uh, Zilpah, Leah's maid, bore Jacob a son. And Leah said, and here there's some different possibilities as what the root means, good fortune, and called his name Gad. Now the term Gad is a root that can also mean a troop and is used that way in some of the prophecies. And it can also mean good news. We use that term today. Have you ever talked about someone gadding about? You see? It's the, same, it's the same root, and uh, that's going to be meaningful to us later on, as you'll see. Okay, and Zilpah, Leah's maid, verse 12, bore Jacob a second son. And Leah said, Happy am I, for the daughters will call me blessed. So she called his name Asher, which means happy. It's a root that implies happy. So now we have four by Leah naturally, two by Bilhah, Rachel's concubine, now two by Leah's handmaid or concubine, if you will. Now, there's a rather sordid incident that comes up that we'll take up later when we we focus on Reuben specifically and all that, but let's just move on to verse 17. 
And God hearkened unto Leah, because Leah is uh, anxious to, to bear. And, uh, she, and so Leah, she conceived and bore Jacob a fifth son. This is out of Leah's loins herself. In other words, this is her fifth son. Leah said, God hath given me my hire, because I have given my maiden to my husband. And she called his name Issachar. So Issachar, in effect, is a root that implies there's no, there, there is recompense, or worth the hire, if you will. And Leah conceived again, and bore Jacob the sixth son. And uh, Leah said, God hath endured me with a good dowry. Now will my husband dwell with me, because I have borne him six sons. And she called his name Zebulun, which is exalted, is one of the renderings from those roots. The way you infer what the root means is by looking at the way it's used. And, and some of the experts will have slightly different reckonings of the, of the roots that make up the proper names. And uh, afterwards she bore a daughter. She's quite a fertile woman. She's given him uh, six of the sons and a daughter, Dinah. And then God remembered, verse 22, God remembered Rachel. God hearkened unto her and opened her womb. And she conceived and bore a son and said, God hath taken away my reproach. And she called his name Joseph, which is in effect, Jehovah has added, or Yahweh has added, if you will. Joseph means that he's been added. And she calls him Joseph and said, the Lord shall add to me another son. Now this is all uh, that goes on for a bit until we get to chapter 35. There's one more son. We've got 11 so far. When we get to chapter 35... Jacob's at Bethel in chapter 35 and all of that, you may recall. We get to verse 16. They journeyed from Bethel. And there was but a little way to come to Ephrath. And Rachel travailed, and she had hard labor. And it came to pass, when she was in hard labor, that the midwife said unto her, Fear not, thou shalt have this son also. And it came to pass, as her soul was in departing, for she died, that she called his name Benoni, but his father called him Benjamin. The son of my sorrow is what Rachel cried, but Jacob modifies that and calls him the son of my right hand. The son of my right hand. So he was a son of the sorrow to the mother, but he was a son of the right hand to the father. Which is interesting because these two labels are attributes of Jesus Christ. And uh, the two aspects of him. He was a suffering one, uh, of whom a sword pierced his mother's heart, we read in Luke chapter 2. Later on, as we learn these tribes better, when you think of Benjamin, you're going to think of a warrior. Saul, King Saul, was a warrior. Saul of Tarsus, who becomes Paul, was a warrior of a different kind, but a warrior nonetheless. And some other exploits of the tribe of Benjamin are, they get themselves in big trouble because of their, their skill at arms, if you will. And so we have now introduced, as our beginning of our study, these 12 sons. Six by Leah, four by the two concubines, two each, and then two by uh, Rachel. And now they, this is a family, Jacob and 12 sons. The next major event that occurs, in a, in a sense, as we build a timeline here, as you know the story, uh, just to summarize it briefly for the interest of time, uh, you all know the story of Joseph and how he's in his youth. He has these strange dreams that may, the, the brothers are envious anyway, but then these dreams that he has, he's uh, uh, naive enough to tell his brothers offend them even more, and so they sell him into slavery. And we'll go through that episode in more detail when we get to studying Joseph more carefully. But as you know the story, that he is sold to, some, uh, to a caravan that takes him down to Egypt. He's uh, uh, sold into Egypt, and through the, through the grace of God, he ends up, after spending some time in prison and what have you, he ends up becoming the prime minister of the world. Egypt ruled the world in those days, or that part of the world, of course. And through God uh, giving Joseph prophetic dreams alters the course of Egypt and the world, really. Because through those dreams, as you know the story, that um, Joseph was able to 
point out to Pharaoh that they've got seven good years coming, but they will be followed by seven lean years. And he advises Pharaoh to take those good years as to store the grain and uh, take care of the excess that that would provide him through the years of leanness. And Pharaoh is not only impressed with the insight, but also impressed by then with uh, Joseph's uh, ostensible management ability, so he puts him in charge of the program. And um, uh, Joseph does some very shrewd things, has a tax program that works rather handsomely, and so not only do they survive very well during that years, but it makes Pharaoh very, very powerful. So he's, he's in good shape. And, of course, it's th- through that prosperity then that the family ultimately, through a whole bunch of interesting episodes, ends up migrating to Egypt. And Jacob and his 11 brothers ultimately through a series of things I don't want to go through all right now, um, end up going to Egypt. So they enter Egypt as a family, but they will leave Egypt as a nation. Because you all know the story that ultimately, after some time, there will be a pharaoh that knew not Joseph. And one of the things that most people don't realize, but if you study, again, Acts chapter 7, the subtlety in the Greek language, there's two words for another in the Greek. One is alos and one is heteros. If I ask for another pencil and you give me an alos pencil, that's one exactly like I had before. If I use in the Greek the word heteros, you give me one that's different than I had before. And so if you study the Greek, when another pharaoh rose, it's a pharaoh of a different kind, i.e., he's not Egyptian. What most scholars are not aware of, that Isaiah points out that he's an Assyrian. So that it helps explain why, in his political tenuousness, they became very concerned because the uh, Jewish population was growing so large. They weren't Egyptian themselves. They were hanging by a thin thread, which is one helps to explain some of the scholastic conjectures that lie behind that whole bit. But you all know the story, how they're oppressed, become slaves, and uh, ultimately are delivered by God through, through Moses uh, and that whole story that... Uh, where Charlton Heston eventually gets them out of there. And, uh, okay. Now, one of the things, as we study the 12 tribes specifically, they are listed uh, 20 times. And relax, we're not going to go verse by verse through all the verses of those 20 different listings. We will touch on a few of them throughout our study. Uh, they've been listed in effect in j- chapters 29 through 35. We've just gone through that list in terms of the natural order of their birth, of the 12 sons. In chapter 46, there's a listing of the 12 tribes as they enter Egypt. One of the things that happens when Jacob does get down to Egypt, by then, Joseph has a bride, he married, has two sons by his wife Asnath. One of the things when we get to Joseph will point out to you that there are a number of ways that Joseph can be viewed as a model or foreshadowing in a, in a mystical sense of Jesus Christ. There is a list in our commentaries of over a hundred ways that Joseph is what's, what a scholar would call a type of Christ. One of the ways is that he took a Gentile bride. He married an Egyptian, right? Right? But not pressing the analogies any further, the two sons that he has by Asenath are Ephraim and Manasseh. I really should say Manasseh and Ephraim. Manasseh was older. Jacob blesses them in a procedure that is very close to what you and I would consider as adoption. But when he blesses the two sons, he crosses his arms. Joseph had positioned them so that the eldest, the firstborn, was at Joseph's right hand, and Ephraim, the second, was the other. And Joseph crosses hands, much to the consternation of their father, Joseph. But Jacob makes it quite clear that he did it deliberately. And he prophesies, in effect, that Ephraim will be the favorite of the two. And indeed he is, because Manasseh becomes, the, at least the half-tribe, uh, settles east of the Jordan, is one of the first to fall into uh, captivity, etc. Ephraim uh, becomes virtually a synonym for the northern kingdom. So we'll talk more about that as we get into the specifics of these tribes. But suddenly now, you learn something that is important to understand if you study the twelve tribes. The first thing about the twelve tribes, you need to understand it's a dozen, but it's a baker's dozen. It's thir- there are actually thirteen tribes. Because the tribe of Joseph has really, in effect, can be split into two, Ephraim and Manasseh. 
Reuben is going to screw up and lose his position as the firstborn, and that, in effect, will devolve upon Joseph. So Joseph is entitled to a double portion. Why Joseph? Because he was the firstborn of Rachel, whom Jacob loved. There was always a favoritism, as you can imagine, by Jacob towards the two youngest, that is, the, uh, the Joseph and, and uh, Benjamin, because they were Rachel's offspring. That was, the, that was his favorite. But anyway, Joseph thus is entitled to a double portion. So now you've actually got an alphabet of 13. And when we get into this a little bit, you'll discover that in the 20 listings of these tribes, that very often one or several will be omitted for various reasons. And we'll explore that when the time comes. They always have a purpose in this. But several times you'll want to list the 12 tribes and leave out one. The best example is the tribe of Levi. And we'll show you an example of that in a few minutes. See, the tribe of Levi was exempt from military duty. So if you wanted to take a roster of the army, you left out Levi because they didn't go to war. But you still want 12 tribes to go to war, right? So what you do then is you take the tribe of Joseph and split them into two, Ephraim and Manasseh. You take Levi out and you still have 12 tribes. It's obvious and yet it can confuse the Bible reader that isn't sensitive to what's going on. If you want all of them and you want 12 tribes, you speak of the tribe of Joseph. If you want to take one tribe out, like say the tribe of Levi, and still have 12, you split Joseph into two. In the book of Revelation, the 12 tribes are listed without mentioning the tribe of Dan. The tribe of Dan's missing. How do you do that? Again, you split the tribe of Joseph in two. In fact, in that particular listing, the Holy Spirit appears to want to avoid even mentioning Ephraim. Yet he's included. How did he do that? They mentioned Manasseh, and then they mentioned Joseph. Well, what's left of Joseph when you take Manasseh out? Ephraim. So Dan is totally out of there, and Ephraim isn't mentioned even though he's included. Why? Because they were the sources of idolatry in the land. And we'll talk about that in more detail when we get there. But as we go through the scripture and we find these various lists, one of the most important places that the twelve tribes will be listed will be in Genesis 49. We're going to talk a lot in these studies about Genesis 49. In Genesis 49, Jacob is at the end of his days and he prophesies over each of his sons. Some of those prophecies are very cryptic riddles. And when we get to the 12 tribes, that's why I want to take them tribe by tribe rather than go through chapter by chapter. We'll go tribe by tribe. We'll go the other way. Is to understand as best we can what those prophecies mean and how they are fulfilled not only throughout the Old Testament, but in the New Testament. The fulfillment of many of these prophecies by Jacob over his sons find fulfillment in the New Testament. And uh, many of those fulfillments, incidentally, are multiple. And when you study carefully the first verse of chapter 49, you'll discover that these prophecies are not only multiply fulfilled, but they also are of the last days, which is one another reason as, as a student of prophecy, you want to be sensitive to all of this. As going, going on with the list, Exodus 1, you have the list when they were entering Egypt. And in that list, of course, Joseph is omitted. Why? Because he's already in Egypt, right? As the prime minister, in effect. In Numbers chapter 1, we have the leaders where Levi is omitted. And, in, and we also have the first census. Again, it's a military census, so the tribe of Levi is omitted. In chapter 2 of Numbers, we have the order of the camp. And I want to talk about that specifically tonight after we go through this list, because there's some surprises there for many. This is the order of the camp, and it's the only order that's given three times. It's given in chapter 2, 7, and 10. In chapter 7, we have the offerings. In chapter 10, we have the order of march. And in chapter 13, we have a list of the spies. There again, Levi is omitted. And in Numbers 34, we have uh, the dividing of the land, omitting the eastern tribes. In Deuteronomy 27, we have the list, they're listed with the blessings and the cursings. Deuteronomy 33 is another one of these key passages. That's where Moses is going to prophesy. Jacob prophesied in Genesis 49. Moses is going to prophesy or bless them, if you will, in chapter 33. And strangely, Simeon is omitted there for some reason. And the order there is, is uh, geographical. In Joshua chapters 13 through 22... The twelve tribes are again listed as they get allocated the various territories after the completion of the conquest of the land. In Judges 5, we have what's called the Song of Deborah, where uh, uh, both uh, Judah and Simeon are omitted. First Chronicles 2, we have the genealogies. There's some strange things in those genealogies we'll talk about when we get there. First Chronicles 12 and 27, we have the officers under David. 
And uh, Gad and Asher are omitted there in, in chapter 27. Ezekiel 48 is another one of the key chapters. That's where we have the division of the land in the millennium. These tribes are going to have a different, a slightly different allocation of territory. That's all detailed by Ezekiel in chapter 48. And then we have, of course, this climactic mystery of Revelation 7, where we have the sealing of 12,000 of each of these 12 tribes. And there again, Dan is omitted for some interesting reasons we'll deal with. In this initial uh, uh, introduction, I plan in the subsequent things to go through tribe by tribe and highlight some of their characteristics so that you'll have a feeling for what that tribe implies when you hear about it and, how, and the prophecies concerning those tribes specifically and how they're fulfilled. But in this introductory time, I'd like to just keep the all 12 in focus as we get sort of an overview. It's interesting how often in the scripture we have 12 stones marking these 12 tribes. You may recall in the story of Joshua, when they crossed the Jordan under Joshua, that he put 12 stones in the middle of the Jordan as well as 12 stones on the banks of the Jordan. Actually, the, the, the leaders of each of the 12 tribes took stones and built the monument on the Jordan side, but then Joshua himself put 12 stones in the, in the middle of the river. It's a model, if you will, of baptism and so forth. We talked about that then. But again, we have these 12 stones uh, underlining, so to speak, the role and mission, destiny, if you will, of the 12 tribes. Also, when we get to uh, Moses and the high priest and the tabernacle, one of the principal vestments of the high priest was the breastplate of 12 stones. And you can go see that today because the Temple Institute has reconstructed the one that they plan to use when the temple is uh, rebuilt. And when you visit Israel, one of the things that you can uh, take a look at uh, is the breastplate for the high priest with those 12 stones, one for each of the 12 tribes. Uh, each one a different stone, and each one with the name of the, the tribe engraved in Hebrew, of course, on each stone. A picture of that is featured on the Temple Institute calendar. You see those around in bookstores and things. And you also see these 12 uh, semi-precious, what we call semi-precious stones, in uh, Revelation 21 as part of the uh, adornment of the New Jerusalem, if you will. Now, something that is more controversial and uh, uh, not accepted by everyone, but it appears that the plan of God can also be discovered in the original Hebrew names of the 12 constellations of what we, you and I might call the Hebrew zodiac. The proper name is the Matzeroth. It may come as a surprise that the 12 constellations that uh, groups of stars that adorn what's called the ecliptic, if you, the, the apparent path of the sun through the sky is called the ecliptic. It's at a slight angle to the celestial equator. Fifteen degrees on either side of the ecliptic is a band called that we call the zodiac. Within that band, there are twelve classical groups of stars. Most of us know them by their Babylonian names. It's amazing as you go through all cultures throughout the world that those names are essentially the same. But they all have their roots, in effect, it would seem, in Babylon. But there is a very provocative view that's quite different. And the view is that they originally had Hebrew names that became corrupted in Genesis 11 with the Tower of Babel and all of that. And one of the other mysteries about if you've ever gone to a planetarium show where you see these things projected and talked about, you see these groups of stars and they're given names and most, I would say uh, 99 out of 100 commentators try to give you some impression that the picture that they represent comes from the arrangement of the stars. As you look at those stars, there's no way you can get a large bear out of Ursa Major. There's no way you can look at Cassiopeia and see a woman chained at a chair. What you've got up there is a bent W, you know. So it's amazing how clumsy and inept are the commentators because the grouping of the stars has nothing to do with the picture that's associated with them. It's the other way around. If you know the names of those stars in the order of their brightness, they represent a story, and the picture summarizes the story. And once you know that, it all starts to make sense. The problem is you need to know the names of the stars by their Hebrew names. And if you know those Hebrew names, you know what you discover that each of the, in the order of brightness, the names suggest they're like a mnemonic to remind children of the story that it represents. And when you learn the names of those stars and the names of the constellations by their Hebrew names, 
you discover something very interesting. You discover that it's the plan of God laid out from the virgin birth of what we call Virgo all the way to Leo, the lion of the tribe of Judah. And uh, if you're really interested, it's very controversial. Many people take exception to this. But if you're interested in some background there, we do have a briefing package called Signs in the Heavens that uh, explores some of this and has a bibliography for those of you that really want to dig into it. But there's something else that I would like to share with you, and that is in Numbers 2 we have the camp of Israel. And I want to use this as an example how the Bible will yield to the diligent. You can take almost anything, and if you start exploring it, you discover some interesting things. Now, in Numbers chapter 1, we have the order of the host, and then we have a census taking. When the census is taken, we discover that what they're doing here is they're taking a military census. Starting about verse 17, Moses and Aaron took these men mentioned by their names. They assembled all the congregation together on the first day of the second month. They declared their lineages after their families, after the house of their fathers, according to the number of the names, from 20 years old and upward by their posts. We're talking men only, fit to go to the war, from, that are older than 20 years. So you don't have the aged ones, you don't have the young ones, you don't have the women and children. Okay? And verse 19, as the Lord commanded Moses, so he numbered them in the wilderness of Sinai, the the children of Reuben. Let's take the first one. Israel's eldest son by their generations after their families, by the house of their fathers, according to the number of their names, by their poles, every male from 20 years old and upward, all who were able to go forth to war. Those who were numbered of them, even the tribe of Reuben, were 40 and 6,500. Well, that's exciting. So there's 46,500 of the tribe of Reuben. Now, these are just the men able to go to war, etc., as I understand. Then it goes on, verse 22, of the children of Simeon, by their generations, after their families, by the house of their fathers. We have the for- same formula, verse 22, it follows exactly. Those who were numbered of them according to the number of their names, by their poles, every male from 20 years old and upward, all who were able to forth go to war. Those who were numbered of them, even the tribe of Simeon, were 50 and 9,300. And I won't take you through all the rest, but if you go through all the rest, you find the same formula. This tribe, there's a number of each one. Each one's different. And uh, I'm fond of making a statement from the public platform that every detail in the Scripture is there by design. That there's no number, no place name, no detail in the Scripture that isn't there by design. The great discovery in my personal life as an engineer, a system background, information scientist of sorts is that these 66 books written by 40 guys over thousands of years are an integrated message, first point. Every detail is there by design. Every number, every place name, every subtlety is there by de- deli- in the original is there by deliberate design. And the second point, of course, is that the origin of this message is from outside time itself. Well, I often get challenged on that. Well, Chuck, if that's true, what's the significance? Why do we need to know 40 and 6,500 of Reuben? The scripture says in Romans 15 verse 4, whatsoever things are written aforetime were written for our learning so that we through the patience and comfort of the scriptures could have hope. Well, Chuck, uh, what, what kind of patience and hope? I can see where the patience comes from, but where does the hope come from with knowing that Reuben has 46,500, etc., etc.? So I'd like to share with you something that I imagine most people reading their Bible might miss. This is a layout. We're going to come to this in a minute, why it's laid out this way. Later on in the book of Numbers, in chapter 2, we're going to have a layout of what's called the camp of Israel. In Numbers chapter 2, we'll discover, and I won't take the time to go and read it, but you can read it on your own, you discover that the tribes always camped around the tabernacle. In the center of the camp, on this diagram, I have east to the bottom Okay, I know that's a little strange. I have reasons for doing that. I'm just strange, that's all. Um, East is to the bottom. But the tabernacle, this portable sanctuary that God had specifically designed and had Moses have built, is in the middle. Moses and Aaron and the priests, those are the descendants of Aaron, camped on the east of the tabernacle. The rest of the tribe of Levi, which are in three families... The Gershonites, Kohathites, and Merites camped on the west, south, and north sides of the tabernacle, respectively. Okay? 
And by the way, the, the Gershonites, they each had special rules. Gershonites took care of the external coverings. The Merorites on the north took care of the structural parts of it. And the Kohathites took care of the uh, internal equipment. So they had, their, they had their jobs. But that whole area that's sort of gray on the diagram was the camp of the Levites. Now, I don't know how much space they took. We find out in the scripture that the Gershonites were about 7,500, Goethites 8,600, and the Merites 6,200. Now, that's just the men. For all these numbers, I imagine if you're really interested in the population, you'd probably want to take a factor like maybe three. I don't know what the numbers. You take a ratio. So all these numbers, if you want to know real populations, might take a factor of three. But that's neither here nor there. What I want us to do, for, you, for reasons that will become evident in a minute, is whatever space the Levites took, that's going to be our unit. I don't know if it's 100 feet or 10 miles, but whatever square that the Levites camped in, that's the place of the Levites. Everybody else is going to camp relative to the Levites, if you read Numbers 2, okay? When you read Numbers 2, you'll also discover that the remaining 12 tribes... Bear in mind, because I'm going to take Joseph and split him into two. So even though I take Levite out, I've still got 12 to deal with. If I take the rest of them, you'll discover by reading the scripture that they are divided into four camps, as they're called. Starting on the east side, you have Judah, Issachar, and Zebulun. Okay? Now, by the way, each one of the 12 tribes, I happen to have annotated the slide with the Babylonian name of the sign of the Matzeroth that is associated with that tribe. That's no big thing, but just so for what it's worth, obviously Judah would be what we call Leo, the lion of the tribe of Judah. And I won't bother with the rest for the moment. The point is that um, the tribe of Judah, Zebulun, and Issachar, those three, were instructed in the Torah to camp together and called the camp of Judah. They were to muster around the tribal standard of Judah. Ephraim, up on the west side, Benjamin and Manasseh, were to be called the camp of Ephraim, and they were to rally around the tribal standard of Ephraim. Reuben, Simeon, and Gad were to rally around the tribal standard of Reuben and camp to the south of the Levites. In each case, the reference is to the Levites. Dan, Naphtali, and Asher were to be called the camp of Dan, and they were to camp north of the Levites. Are we all together so far? Okay? Well, the first thing you notice here, if you're perceptive, is there are, of the twelve, there are four tribal standards that are conspicuous, because they are the four tribal standards that mark the camps, each consisting of three tribes. The camp of Judah rallied around a sign of the lion. Ephraim and Manasseh, the the sign of the tribe of Joseph, was the ox. The tribal standard of Reuben was a man. And the tribal standard of Dan was originally a scorpion, later adopted an eagle. Well, if you've studied your Bible, you can't help but get triggered here because you've got a man, an ox an eagle and a lion and you immediately think of the passages in Ezekiel and Revelation where the four faces associated with the cherubim and the throne of God are what? A lion, a man, an ox, and an eagle. And you wonder, gee, is there some relationship with these symbols and the throne of God? I don't want to get into a whole study of the Gospels But some scholars have noticed that the four Gospels each have a specific design. And if you've been with us in any of our Gospel studies, we've gone through this in great detail. Matthew presents Jesus as the Messiah. He's Jewish. He's principled as the Mashiach, the Messiah of Israel, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, if you will, because he's a Jew, etc. And everything, uh, the genealogy, it's the legal genealogy of Abraham, what he said, who it's written to, the first miracle, what it ends with, all these things are consistent with his primary theme as Jesus is the Messiah. Mark is the only gospel without a genealogy. He presents Jesus Christ as the servant. The symbol of a servant classically is the ox. 
And um, uh, there is no genealogy in Mark. It's the only one without one. But he emphasized what Jesus did. He really wrote not to the Jew but to the Roman. And uh, everything else in there is consistent with that uh, uh, design concept. Luke was a physician. He was interested in Jesus' humanity. And so he uh, presents Jesus Christ as the Son of Man. And uh, his symbol would be then thus considered, uh, some people consider a man. He takes his genealogy from Adam, the first man, all the way through. And it's the bloodline, not the legal line of David, but the bloodline from David, different son of David, the second surviving son of Bathsheba, Nathan, rather than Solomon, the royal line. But in any case, that goes down to Mary. And again, he wrote to the Greek, and uh, every detailer, he has the promise of the Holy Spirit. Why? Because his volume two is the book of Acts, the follow-through of all of that, the works of the Holy Spirit. And on it goes. John was the mystic. He presents Jesus Christ as the Son of God, makes no bones about it, says so in his last or next to the last chapter. And uh, so as you go right on through, he does have a genealogy people don't recognize. It's the first three verses of the genealogy of the pre-existent one. But uh, anyway, that's, uh, uh, he writes not to the Jew, Roman, or Greek, but to the church. And his first miracle is expressive of that in terms of the water purification being turned to wine and all of that. And so, but the, anyway, the point is, if you study the structure of the four Gospels, you can suggest the possibility, at least, of those four symbols. The lion, the ox, the man, and the eagle being suggestive, at least, of those four Gospels. They certainly are represented in the faces of the cherubim. So we have some possible mysticism going on here. Let's leave this, go back to the original chart, if I, the one we had just a minute ago. Thank you. Now, one of the things, getting back to the question we talked about, is there some spiritual significance in any of this? Well, there's certainly some possibilities. But what about these weird numbers? To the best of my knowledge, there's two things that most people have not bothered to do. And they have not bothered to add up the population of the four camps. If you take uh, Judah, Issachar, and Zebulun, take the 4,400, the, 70, the 74,600, and the 57,400, you discover that the population of the camp of Judah was 186,400. Isn't that exciting? The Reuben is 151,400, and Ephraim 108,100, and Dan 157,600. And after you've checked my arithmetic, we'll move on, right? Or will you stipulate that for this presentation? Okay, we'll move on. For the next slide, you need to think like a rabbi. Okay? Now, that square in the middle is where the Levites camp. Okay? I want you to imagine that you're the head of the tribe of Judah, or, and thus the head of the camp of Judah. Your symbol is the lion. These uh, other tribes are gathering about you. You've got an interesting problem, because the Torah tells you that you are to camp east of the Levites. Okay? If you're camping, you can camp Whatever width this camp is, that's your flexibility. Let's say it's 100 yards. If that's 100 yards, your camp can be 100 yards wide. If you go further this way, you are no longer east. You're southeast. Follow me? If you're going to be strict like a rabbi, you wouldn't allow your camp to get over here. You're not following the Torah. You've got a camp east of the Levites. If you go too far to the right here, you're now northeast, right? So you have to confine yourself to whatever the Levites take. This width is our unit, and you camp this way, eastward, as much as you need. You with me so far? It's important that you grasp this to go further. Now, if I am Ephraim and his gang, I can camp the same thing. I can camp this wide, but I just go west as much as I need. In other words, I am forced to stay on what's called the cardinal points of the compass because if I make my tribal area anything else, I'm no longer following the law, no longer following the Torah. You with me? And the same thing with Reuben and Dan on you know, south and north, respectively. Now I want you to take a flight of fancy with me. You and I, in our imagination are going to go outside where I have a very specially equipped Bell Jet Ranger. This Jet Ranger has an unusual piece of equipment that's called a time machine. So what we're going to do is we're going to get into this Jet Ranger and we're going to take off and we're going to go to Israel. It's got plenty of range. <laughs> and while we're doing this, we're going to set the time machine back. We'll probably set it back to the days of Numbers 
We'll probably set it back to the days of Balaam when he was up on the mountain with Balak looking down upon the camp of Israel. And as we look down, as we approach the camp of Israel, we're going to approach it from the east, from the bottom of our slide. We're going to start moving this way. As we take our binoculars and look at the center, we find at the center of the camp of Israel the tabernacle, which symbolizes the presence of God. We find it surrounded by four faces. A lion, an ox, a man, and an eagle. And of course we recognize that at least symbolically as symbolic of the throne of God as exemplified in Ezekiel and Isaiah and Revelation where we see the throne of God and we encounter these strange symbols in the seraphim or the cherubim, what have you. But there's something else that will catch our eye as we fly over. Let's plot this thing by to scale. The largest camp is Judah, which is 186,400, so it's the longest leg of this four-legged campsite. The shortest one is at the top, Ephraim, with 108,100. Reuben and Dan are essentially the same, or essentially roughly 150 plus thousand. But as we approach this in our imaginary Bell Jet Ranger, what do we see? The cross of Christ. The longest one being the baseline, these two being essentially equal, and the shortest one at the top. What does that mean? Whatever you want it to. Some people look at this, Chuck, you're making, so you're, you're making something out of nothing. I don't think so. If I take the scripture and I apply rigor to it, it shows me that if when the camp was encamped according to the Torah, when God looked down, what did he see? He saw a cross. And that cross, that wooden cross that was erected in Judea 2,000 years ago, is the centroid of all of history of the universe. On that cross, God himself gave himself so that you and I could live. And everything else in the scripture, every detail in the scripture, whether it's the population of the tribes, whether it's whatever, points, illuminates, highlights some nuance, some aspect, some perception of the redemption that God engineered before the world began, before Adam sinned, because God knew he would. He alone knows the end from the beginning. Nothing's an afterthought. It's all by his grand design. And when did God start dealing with you? Before the foundation of the world was laid, Ephesians 1, 4 tells us. One of the things that I encourage you to do, we're going to be exploring the 12 tribes, we have a briefing pack called the, the Mystery of the Lost Ark, which has, uh, besides a lot of stuff about the Ark of the Covenant, which is curious, it also has a study of the tabernacle, as it, every detail, every metal, every material, every detail of the tabernacle points to Jesus Christ. Very, very fruitful study that goes even beyond what we've talked about here. But we're going to discover, as we continue our exploration of the 12 tribes, we're going to discover behind, hidden behind these cryptic prophecies hidden behind these various um, mysteries of the 12 tribes. We're going to discover many of them are fulfilled in the New Testament. All of them, in one way or another, will point to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. God always rewards the diligent. When you encounter a passage in the Scripture that puzzles you, just know that if you will devote the time and energy and, and, and resourcefulness that you'll discover something you didn't know about the person of Jesus Christ. Because that's what it's all about. The book of Revelation says that, uh, that uh, the testimony of Jesus Christ is the spirit of prophecy. Let's stand for a closing word of prayer.